For the mystery of iniquity is already worketh, only that he who now holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way, and then the wicked one shall be revealed. Now, this quote from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, St. Paul says, Do not be disturbed by word or letter attributed us as if the day of the Lord were at hand. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, etc., etc. It says, You know what we hold it. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work, provided that he who now holds does hold, though he's gotten out of the way, then the wicked one will be revealed. And here, Father Sylvester Berry is saying that, so you can see, uh, now that you've seen the whole uh, quote there, anything I'll find this. Review this one more time. The words of St. Paul to the Thessalonians may be a reference to the papacy as the obstacle to the coming of Antichrist. Where he says, until he has gotten out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is at work. Until he's gotten out of the way, then the wicked one will be revealed. No doubt in my mind that this was the devil's master stroke to destroy the papacy or try to at least try to destroy the papacy, the papal office will always exist. But to bring about with, from within the church an apostasy so that the men who are being supposedly elected are not popes at all and the true popes gotten out of the way. Uh, let me see if we can find here. Quotes, 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 quotes. The tale of the dragon represents the cunning hypocrisy with which he succeeds in deceiving a large number of the people and pastors, a third part of the stars. Arianism led away many bishops, priests, and peoples. The pretended reformation of the 16th century claimed a still larger number, but these cannot be compared to the numbers seduced by Satan in the days of the Antichrist. Okay, we're getting, it's getting better. Now, this was written in the 1920s. It is now the hour for the powers of darkness. The newborn son of the church is taken to God and to his throne. Scarcely has the newly elected pope been enthroned when he's snatched away by martyrdom. The mystery of iniquity gradually developing through the centuries cannot be fully consummated by the power the papacy endures. But now that he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, during the interregnum, when there's no pope, the wicked one shall be revealed in his fury against the church. It is a matter of history that the most disastrous periods for the church were times when the papal throne was vacant or when anti-popes contended with the legitimate head of the church. Thus also shall it be in those evil days to come. Let's see if there's anything else here. Um, I think we covered the gist of what we wanted to cover here between Father Sylvester Berry and his commentary on the Apocalypse, Chapter 12, and also uh, Cardinal Manning on the, the Pope and the Antichrist. But let's, let's make one thing clear, and that is Satan is very active in trying to confuse everyone. There's some people that think that Francis I is the Pope and he's doing a great job and everything's wonderful and Vatican II is the greatest thing since sliced bread, etc. Uh, there's some people that say, ah, there's something wrong. Some, there's a problem in the church. But it's those bishops not obeying the Pope. And then you have people that say, well, he's the Pope and he's doing wrong. And he's even a scandal sometimes. And he's committing sin and he's doing things in imprudence, but he's still the Pope. Then you have people who say, he's the Pope even though he's teaching heresy. And they're very, very confused about that. That right brings me to the Society of St. Pius X. As you know, Bishop Williamson, one of the four bishops consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre, he was expelled from the Society. So he has taken up the cause to be the true, loyal son of Archbishop Lefebvre. 
the interesting thing between Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, the conservative Archbishop Lefebvre the liberal, is that you have both Bishop Fillet, who's the head of the uh, Society of St. Pius X, and now Bishop Williamson outside of society, both using quotes to support their position. Bishop Williamson can quote from Archbishop Lefebvre, the conservative, who's saying, this church is schismatic and heretical, it's not the Catholic Church, etc., etc. And on the other hand, you have Bishop Fillet saying, well, Archbishop said this and this and this. It's, who is true? They're both true, because Archbishop Lefebvre said both things. He was, when he was talking to conservatives, he had a hard line. When he was talking to liberals, he had a, a liberal line. We don't have a lot of time, because I, I do have some quotes from Archbishop Lefebvre. I'd just like to touch upon it very briefly, and then we're going to very summarily cover some of the issues that are sometimes used against us and the answers we have up here in a very nice, uh, concise booklet here. But this is Archbishop Lefebvre in 1976. Hard to read. I apologize. But he was suspended from functioning as a bishop. He's, uh, Paul VI suspended Archbishop Lefebvre, saying you can't offer Mass, you can't administer the sacraments, you're suspended. You're forbidden to function. And what was his response? He says, talking about the Vatican II Church, that conciliar church is a schismatic church because it breaks with the Catholic Church it has always been. It has new dogmas, it's new priesthood, it's new institutions, it's new worship, all already condemned by the church and many a document official and definitive. And he goes on to explain the conciliar church is schismatic. He uses uh, you know, reference to the Novus Ordo, the definition of the Mass as of the assembly of the people of God with the priest being a presider to bring about the presence of Christ. It's not the words of consecration. It's the assembly Nova Sotl says an assembly that brings about the presence of Christ. So he's condemning that. He's condemning religious liberty as blasphemous, etc., etc. Get to the meat of the matter. The church that affirms such errors is at once schismatic and heretical. This conciliar church, therefore, is not Catholic. Sounds really good. That's exactly what we would say. But then again, this is where, like Bishop Williamson, he can quote from these saying, you know, that's what the bishop, archbishop said. But then you have, this is from the, uh, this is from 30 Days magazine. Now this is really very, very difficult to read. It's, 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 they, unfortunately, they, they darkened it and they try to set it off. But the basic gist is this. There's two letters of Archbishop Lefebvre and I can read it to you because it's not going to show up here. But he maintains, he says, Holy Father, to put an end to some of the doubts that are now circulating in Rome in certain traditional areas of Europe and America, concerning my attitude and thought with regard to the Pope, the Council, the Mass of the Nova Sordo, and fearing that some of these doubts have even reached your holiness, permit me to state, again, which I have always expressed. I have no hesitation regarding le your legitimacy and validity of your election. Consequently, I can't tolerate anyone who does not direct prayers to God prescribed by the Church for your holiness. We must interpret Vatican II in light of tradition. And he says, with the Novus Ordo, I've never said it was invalid or heretical. And then he gives another quote here. He's writing to this uh, cardinal. He repeats the same thing over again. I, I recognize the hierarchy. I recognize the Pope. Uh, we must interpret the Vatican II in light of tradition. I've never said uh, that any of the decrees of the council are invalid or heretical. And, uh, and the same thing when he actually wrote with, together with uh, Bishop Castromayer about the new code of canon law. He said, this new code of canon law contains heresy. Well, who promulgated it? The man you're writing to. And how does he end the letter? Kneeling at your feet, Holy Father, I beg your blessing. Well, you just accuse this man of heresy. Now, in the midst of all this confused papers up here, there was a quote from Archbishop Lefebvre when he was interviewed in 1988 after he had consecrated the four bishops. He was interviewed by a fellow by the name of Stefano Pacci, who writes for 30 days. I've talked to that uh, reporter one time in 1992. Uh, Father at the time was Bishop Dolan, Father Dolan at the time, and Father Ephraim were with me in Rome 
we had an interview with this 30 Days magazine. But Stefano Pacci interviewed Archbishop Lefebvre and asked him, now what's the future of your, church, the future of your movement now that you consecrated these four bishops? This is 1988, by the way. Archbishop Lefebvre says, I'm hoping within a few years, no more than five, maybe more, that Rome will come back to the faith. And Stefano Pacci asked Archbishop Lefebvre, and if that doesn't happen, then he says, then it's the end of the church. He says, I am not one to say that there's no pope. He says, I'm not one to say that. He says, but I do say that this pope's ideas are heretical and lead to heresy. That's a new one on me. You have ideas that are heretical, but you're not a heretic. That's very interesting. Now, <clears throat> last year <clears throat> for the conference, we uh, presented a booklet, and it's called Answering the Objections to the City of Econ's Position. I know that some of you are not familiar with that because some of you asked me questions about this and that. But in that booklet, you can get it right on off the Internet, off the CMRI.org website, Answering the Objections to the City of Econ's Position. It's not my opinion. We're quoting from popes and the theologians and doctors of the church about those objections to our position. Just to summarize them very quickly, because we are really about eight minutes now until we have to end with an Angelus. First position is perpetual successors, that there always has to be someone on the throne. So you say to the contest, you can't answer that. There's no way that there can be 50 or 40 years of no pope. Well, to, as a matter of fact, there have been times of interregnum that extended for nearly three years, year and a half. Nowhere does the Catholic Church say it can only be a year or a year and a half or three years, but no more than this. And the church doesn't say any of that. In fact, there are theologians that say even a long interregnum, even an interregnum of 40 years, as is possible, you know, they don't believe that it happened, but it was possible during the time when three men were claiming to be Pope, the Great Western Schism, even if there was no Pope for 40 years, it's still not against perpetual successors. The office always exists. You don't always have an, uh, somebody occupying the office. And as we're reading from Sylvester's, uh, Father Sylvester Berry on the Apocalypse, Satan knows he wreaks the most amount of havoc when there is no Pope. The mystery of iniquity will become manifest when he has gotten out of the way who's been withholding it. And so Father Sylvester Berry says that very probably pertains to the Pope, the papacy. Then you read the writings of the Masons. The Masons say, we can't destroy the church. We have to infiltrate within. We have to get one of our own men on the throne. And, and to me, what we're speaking is very objective, and we see the evidence. These men are promoting Freemasonic principles, religious indifferentism, religious liberty, ecumenism. These are all Freemasonic principles that are publicly, officially being taught by the modern church. What was the other objection? Uh, the other objection was <clears throat> that um, if the cardinals elect him, Pope Pius XII said uh, for, for the conclave, for the election of a pope, all penalties are lifted. In fact, there was a priest... He was uh, writing for the uh, the Rock or this Rock, this apologetic magazine that comes out. Which I forget his name right now, but he was saying that white smoke, valid Pope. That when it comes to the conclave, Pope Pius XII says there's no penalties. So even if they elect a heretic, a schismatic, or a Freemason, valid election. Now it is true, Pope Pius XII did say, for the validity of the election if there are any ecclesiastical church penalties or censures on any of the cardinals or the conclave, all those are lifted to ensure the validity of a pope. But what he did not say was those things that are forbidden by divine law. Ecclesiastical penalties would be things like, let's hypothetically say somebody gets elected pope, one of the cardinals, and another cardinal doesn't like his election. says, well, you know, he... he, he finance of an abortion for one of his nieces or, or something like that. He was excommunicated or he did this or he did that. Those are what we call ecclesiastical penalties. But when it comes to heresy, heresy bars 
a person, a heretic, is barred by divine law from being elected the Pope. And we give ample references to that. So if you read the Answering the Objections of the Study of Econ Disposition, it's on cmri.org. Uh, we've, we pressed those pamphlets out last year. It's just nothing but quote from popes and, and Pope Innocent III and Pope Paul IV and what the, the saints and doctors of the church teach. Um, I'm trying to think of another one that they might say, oh, uh, he has to be declared a heretic. And that is the unique thing about the pope. It is true, no one's over the pope, the pope's supreme head of the church, and where people go wrong is they try to judge things according to canon law, where in canon law it says for somebody to be heretic, you've got to warn them and warn them, and then you declare them a heretic. But not so with the papacy, because if the pope becomes a manifest heretic, ipso facto, he deposes himself, he's deposed by God. If he falls into the sin of heresy, it's not because of the crime of heresy, but the sin of heresy he ceases to be the Pope. That's not my opinion, but if you get that, we have it listed, you know, all the different evidences of papal teachings and teachings of the church on that matter. Uh, but I would just like to say in general, we are in very confusing times. And the issue is, is this. We need to look to what did the church teach in the past? And we follow that. And I would also like to encourage you, you know, you all have an opportunity to go to the bookstore. I am just amazed when I read the encyclicals of the, of the pape, well, the popes, the papal encyclicals. They are such a wealth of wisdom in every aspect. Christian education and Christian matrimony. Uh, all the different aspects of our, our Catholic way of life, the popes have treated about this. They're, they're just so jam-packed with quotes from Scripture and the fathers of the church and so wonderfully explain our faith. So even though we live in difficult times, there is no present occupant in the papal office. Nevertheless, God has not abandoned us. We have this wealth of, this wealth of uh, information there to guide us in these difficult times. I'd also like to say this too. Some of the, one of the arguments against this I issue of, you know, say to me, is that if this, is Latin, if, if this has existed for such a long time, there's no more cardinals left. So you can't elect a pope, so that can't, the state of Econism can't be valid because there's no more cardinals. But the fact of the matter is, is this. It was in um, ten, the 1000s ten that Pope Nicholas II established cardinals for the election of a pope. Prior to that, the clergy and the people of Rome appointed and, and elected the man to be Pope, the head of the, the Universal Church. Theologians teach this. If all the cardinals died, let's say the conclave, the, if the conclave, the roof comes down, everybody dies, or if, if the cardinals were doubtful, as in the case of the Western Schism, when there were three men claiming to be Pope, they didn't know which group had the true cardinals. The Universal Church has the right to elect its head. So in theory, in, in practicality, it's not impossible for a pope to be elected. And that's one of the things that they try to throw against us is that, well, you don't have any more cardinals. There's no need for cardinals. If there's no cardinals, if there's a doubtful cardinals, it falls upon the universal church. And those are, those are what theologians teach. And we give reference after reference with that. And with that said, I'd also like to throw out, I think it is absolutely, positively, the height of imprudence for some small group in Montana or some group in Europe, or somebody down in South America to elect their own person, the Pope. It's not the universal church. It's, it, it makes our position very, it weakens the credibility of our position in the eyes of the rest of the people. Well, look at you crazy state of a contest. You have eight or nine popes. Just because there's crazies out there doesn't mean that our position objectively is not true. And the important thing is, what does the church teach? What has the church taught? You know, I like to do this. We're almost at the time of the Angelus, but I just like to throw out any questions out there. Please don't raise your hands. Yes. <laughs> well, I would... Uh, no, uh, you know, there's this issue at Cardinal Siri, and that comes up, you know, every once in a while. Uh, in the 1958 election of John XXIII, 
uh, it's a matter of fact that white smoke came up, the crowds were cheering, and then they were told, no, no, no election. And then the smoke came up again and Ron Colley got elected. And I do remember reading in this magazine, 30 Days, which is a Novus Ordo magazine, but it's translated in five different languages. They did, t- do, they did it, do an interview with Cardinal Siri, and he was one of the things he expressed is he wished they could lift the silence that's imposed upon the cardinals for the conclave. He wished, I mean, that was an interesting point that Cardinal Siri of all people would say that. But being, that being said, the idea that maybe Cardinal Siri was elected and that he was threatened and he abdicated and they elected Ron Colley, that's plausible because the smoke came up twice. But that Cardinal Siri was a secret pope, there's, there's no validity to that. He went back to Genoa, functioned, you know, as the Cardinal Archbishop of Genoa. He never made any public stand. He never made any public statements. He never publicly claimed that he was pope. The church is visible. It's not we have the secret pope and the secret cardinals and nobody knows about these things and we can't prove any of these things. It's not how the church operates. It's just that's not it. And for as long as some of these people who have promoted this have said, we got the evidence. I mean, I've been waiting to see. And I'd like to see. Let me, let me see the objective evidence proving he was the pope. There's nothing there. I mean, they have some suspicions and some possibilities, etc., but there's no proof. And I, I think that that's just, it's just not, you just don't want to go there. It's just, there's no, there's no proof for that. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. If possible, the elect. What we mean by the elect, those who God has, you know, God has, given us graces to know we're Catholics and we're, and we're, we're chosen by God. We, a, faith is a gift. We have the gift of faith. We're Catholics. We belong to the one true church of Christ. But the devil will try to especially deceive, if possible, even those who are Catholics and even those who are traditional Catholics. And you know what's, I mean, this happens, I mean, I've been in the traditional movement since probably 69 or 70, and, you know, some people that were traditional Catholics have either given up, become home aloneers, and said there's no church, the church is dead, there's no more bishops or priests, just stay home, make an act of contrition, and wait for the end. That's being deceived. That's as if the church has died. But Christ promises apostles, I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. The church is apostolic, there has to be bishops in the church. So those home aloneers are deceived. And then you have other groups of people that say, well, we've got to fight from within. So we're going to stay within the Novus Ordo, and uh, we're going to try to change things within. You're on, a, you're on a, a ship that's not sinking, it's sunk. You know, you're on the bottom looking up, and bubbles are coming up, and we've got to try to train to keep this boat, up, boat afloat. It's just, you're already on the bottom. Sorry. But, so, I mean, there's so many different opinions out there, and, and so many people get hooked into one thing or another. You have the the Fatima Crusade movement, uh, Fatima Crusaders, Father Nicholas Gruner, and they keep promoting all that Francis I or Benedict XVI or John Paul II had to do is just consecrate Russia and everything's going to convert. It's all going to become good again. No, we're, we're already past that. We're in the apostasy now. And on the verge of maybe a possible something catastrophic happening worldwide to bring about a new world order under Antichrist. I mean, I believe that what happens politically as what has happened spiritually and religiously in the church, this didn't happen by accident. It was a very well-orchestrated destruction of the church and a bringing down of society, and it's culminating in a world religion under Antichrist. No doubt in my mind, and no doubt in my mind that the modern church, not the Catholic church at all, and for those who keep maintaining it, especially those who are traditional Catholics saying, that's still the Pope. We still need to look to them and to the bishops as, as being the Catholic hierarchy. They are not. They're not infallible. They're teaching heretical things. They're doing things that are condemned by the church. The magisterium, if the living magisterium can in any way be false, as Pope Leo XIII said, an evident contradiction would follow, then God would be the author of that error because he who hears them would hear Christ. So, any other questions? Yes. Well, baptism, anybody can baptize. So long as the water's poured and he says the right words, baptism's valid. Confession would be invalid because there's a doubt about the priesthood. 
the validity of those priests being ordained. Even those who belong to the fraternity of St. Peter, even though they were ordained with a traditional rite, the bishops who are consecrating them are novus ordo rite ordained or consecrated. And that's, that's, that's where the problem comes in. It's very clever. Everyone looks to 1969 with the novus ordo, but the bigger problem is 1968 with the, with the, the, the derailing of the, of the Episcopal consecration of bishops. That's, you know, you can have someone wearing vestments like I wore this morning and saying the in Tribal Altari Day, but if he's not a priest, there's no mass. But it's very clever how the devil was, he knew human nature and he did this very, very succinctly, incrementally. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. And today, when you look at the statistics, so many Catholics don't even know what it means to be a Catholic. It's just, it's pitiful. Pitiful. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I, w I, would, I would say this. If there is a bishop out there, I don't know of him. We can't point to him. Uh, I know that there have been some people that have looked up all those bishops that were, uh, who had a papal mandate and were consecrated under Pope Pius XII. So they have ordinary jurisdiction. Many of them are in retirement. They're very elderly. Uh, they haven't made a stand now. Uh, you know, you could argue that maybe canonically their uh, resignation was not valid because they didn't, um, their, their resignation was not validly accepted. But I would have to say, by and large, those bishops all went along with Vatican II. They were all part of the Novus Ordo and all these other things. So, you know, there's some things that I, personally speaking, do I know all that God is doing and all that has happened, and do I have an answer for everything? No. There are certain things that I, I think are mysteries. But I would also have to say this too. We talked about this at a priest meeting. Just like, and we can read this from uh, Cardinal, or this uh, Monsignor Journey, if I could find this very quickly here. Uh, this would be very interesting to read. He talks about the uh, time of the, the church and the time of a vacancy. It would be too hard or too long. Well, maybe I can find it here. Just give me another second here. Uh, this is this is what I would show you here real quickly. This might be a lot of kind of light here. In 1950s, this was a Monsignor Charles Journey. The Church during the vacancy of the Holy See. We must not think of the Church when the Pope is dead as possessing the papal power in act, in a state of disfusion, so that she herself can delegate it to the next Pope in whom it will be recondensed and made definite. When the Pope dies, the church is widowed. And in respect of the visible universal jurisdiction, she is truly acephalous. But she is not acephalous as are the schismatic churches, nor like a body on the way to decomposition. Christ directs her from heaven. There is left no one, there is no one left on earth than on earth who can visibly exercise the supreme spiritual jurisdiction in his name, and in consequence, any new manifestations of the general life of the church are prevented. But though slowed down, the pulse of life has not left the church. She possesses the power of the papacy in potency. She has the potentiality to elect the Pope. <clears throat> in the sense that the Christ, who has willed her always to depend on a visible pastor, has given her power to designate the man to whom he himself commit the keys of the kingdom of heaven as once he committed them to Peter. Now, that being said, that the potentiality there of electing the Pope, and we've talked about this before, it would fall upon the universal church to elect its head. Um, whether we can point to someone in ordinary jurisdiction or not, that's not important right now. 
I just have to go on and act upon what I know. Bishop Archbishop Took consecrated Bishop Carmona. Bishop Carmona consecrated me. And there's absolutely positively no doubt in my mind that the church supplies for jurisdiction. In fact, we have a case here. This is an area of jurisdiction. When there were three men claiming to be Pope, This is from Reverend Father Timothy Zapayena. 1946, he was a canon lawyer from Rome in his book, De Ecclesia Christi. Well, first of all, he talks about how jurisdiction comes from the Pope to the rest of the bishops and the rest of the church. So after speaking about this, he, he raises objections, and then he answers those objections. But upon granting or allowing our thesis, there follows serious problems for the time of the Western schism. Certainly a doubtful pope is no pope. However, during the whole time of the schism, a true pope was doubtful. Therefore, there was none. And hence, he could not confer jurisdiction upon the bishops. It would follow, therefore, that the bishops confirmed by a doubtful pope lack true jurisdiction. The same may be said about priests who receive jurisdiction in the internal form from these bishops. But nevertheless, the bishops gathering gathered at the Council of Constance supposed that they had the power to convoke a council and repair the schism. So that's the objection he's raising, and then he answers this. Response A. It, is permiss it would be permissible in the first place to turn back the argument upon our adversaries. The aforesaid difficulty presses them all in the same way as it does us. For all admit that the bishops to exercise actual jurisdiction need either pontifical election or recognition. If a doubtful pope cannot confer jurisdiction, neither can he truly confirm a bishop who is chosen or consecrated. Therefore, let the response be direct. According to those things which we have said in Thesis 2a, now he's talking about the great Western schism, there were three men claiming to be pope, one in Rome, Avignon, and in Pisa. The true pope was the Roman one, that is Urban VI and his successors. Therefore, he was able to give jurisdiction even to the bishops of the other obediences on account of the common error of the faithful together with the colored title. What he's talking about here is what they call supply jurisdiction. So if someone followed the, the, the supposed pope in Avignon, as did St. Vincent Ferrer, St. Catherine of Siena believed the, pope was, the true pope was in Rome. St. Vincent believed the true pope was in Avignon. He had two people being saints on two different sides. But he is saying here that the, the true Pope was one in Rome, but by supply jurisdiction for the good of the faithful, jurisdiction was given to also those who were on the wrong side of the fence, either in Pisa or in Avignon. Even the election of Martin V seems to be explained by the faculty given to the council by Gregory XII. For the rest, if you figure that those three popes to be null, even if you say there was no pope at the time, because they were all doubtful, you ought to admit that jurisdiction is supplied on the count of the color of title, not indeed by the church, which lacks the supreme power, but by Christ himself, who had conferred jurisdiction on each of the anti-popes as much as was possible. Now, anti-popes here, they were not heretics. This was not truly a schism in the proper sense of the word, because no one doubted the papacy, no one dis, you know, denied the papacy. They were not sure who the true pope was because the, the majority of cardinals who elected Urban VI turned around and said, we were under duress. There wasn't a valid election. They, re, they elected a, a Clement up in Avignon, and then Clement died, and Urban VI died, and, the, and both groups elected another successor. Then people got to Pisa and said, enough with this. We're going to straighten out the position of the church. They elected the third man pope in Pisa, so there was a lot of confusion out there. These men that were being consecrated were truly valid bishops, but if they were in Pisa or in Avignon, they were not being appointed by a true pope, but nevertheless, for the benefit of the faithful, they had jurisdiction supplied to them. And that's also in canon law. Canon 209 said, talks about supplied jurisdiction. And one last area I'd like to preach, speak about real quickly. <clears throat> you have home owners saying, well, Bishop Hibernus doesn't have a jurisdiction. Priests of Mount St. Michael's, CMRI priests don't have any jurisdiction, so you can't go to them. Well, this is what it says in moral theology. 
priests who have the care of souls, who are pastors, which jurisdiction, they are obliged by justice because they're pastors to administer the sacraments. If there's a plague and people are dying, that pastor may not leave his area to save his own hide, his skin. His own skin. He has to stay, stay there, administer the sacraments because he's the pastor. And he has to do that in justice. It says those who do not have the care of souls, those who are not pastors, they must administer the sacraments to the faithful in charity. If pastors are not available, other priests must administer sacraments in charity. And so, these people that are getting into this, you know, no jurisdiction, got to stay at home alone, the idea of, of, of supply jurisdiction is something very, very real in canon law. And you have saints like St. Alphonso Liguri in his moral theology who talk about a priest even if you don't have jurisdiction, has the obligation. So what is supply jurisdiction? When I function as a bishop, when I administer confirmation, when I hear confessions or offer mass, at that moment the church is granting me jurisdiction to function. And so, you know, whether there's a bishop out there with ordinary jurisdiction or not, who he is, where he's at, where he's been, I don't know. But I do know this, that we are Catholic, we have valid orders, the church supplies jurisdiction, and how things are going to come together in the future not 100% sure. I'm going to watch and see how God lets things unfold. But I know what I need to do now and those things that I can only speculate about, you know, I can't, I don't have any control over that. Uh, and let's be honest with the situation. It is very confusing. The devil has been a master stroke at deceiving many, many people. So important thing is we know what the Catholic faith is. We know what the church has taught. Part of Vatican II, we know Vatican II is no good and what's going on there is no good. We need to be strong in the faith. And don't let outward appearances, oh, he's wearing a white robe, or there's a billion people that follow him, or everyone is hailing him, or look at all the externals. Uh -uh. It's not a matter of numbers, not a matter of externals. Let's look at the objective evidence. Let's remember truth is conformity to reality, and let us remember the criterion of truth is objective evidence, concrete proof, things that we can point to, not purely imaginary or respective, oh, you know, these, look at all these majority of people saying this or that. doesn't mean anything. The important thing is we know what the church has taught. We abide by that and we be faithful to that. You know, I'm going to be running to missing my flight. So let's stand for the Angelus. If someone wants to help me out, if somebody...